house of the Lord, yes, wherever you are, the presence of God is right there with you. And we pray that even as we worship, we shall continue to experience that and even more. His presence is omnipotent and omnipresent. And I pray that today shall be your day of victory in the name of Jesus. Well, we're going to sing a few songs. I know you know these songs. So I'm going to need you to sing along with us. And, and wherever you are, I pray that today you shall experience God in a mighty supernatural way. Come on, are you guys ready? Yeah. Let's do this. right where we are and indeed you remain to be God it doesn't matter what other things have risen themselves as gods 
it doesn't matter all those things are the works of men only you are God and I pray the Lord we shall exalt you and exalt you only indeed Lord forgive us even for the times when we exalted our resources and our monies and our jobs and our children and our families our cars and houses and we forgot to exalt you I pray the Lord today shall be the day that we start something new the relationships shall be refreshed and nourished that our resources shall be redirected back to you because you're the giver of it all we love you Lord we give you all the praise Jehovah come on just lift up your voice lift your hands and worship him wherever you are
safe refuge, my treasure, Lord, you are my friend and king, anointed one, most holy. Yes, Lord, you are my hiding place. It's not my money, that's my hiding place. A lot of us hide in the resources that we have. We think if we have it all, we don't need Jesus. But Lord, we declare in this very minute that you are our hiding place. I pray that you shall be exalted over everything for the glory and all of your name. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. Well, we still have so much lined up for you, please don't go nowhere. In fact, you could send someone a message right now and tell them chat is on and let them tune in because this message is life-changing. This message is for you. God bless you even as you continue to get ministered to. Amen. Wow, wow, wow. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm so excited to have every one of us here. Thank you, worship team, for another amazing, amazing time of worship. My name is Muredi Wanjao or Pastor M. And I just want to welcome you to church today. I'm so glad you're here with us. And as we're even getting ready to receive God's word and, uh, and engage in hearing what God has for us today, I want to say a big welcome to our visitors. Uh, we delight in having you here. Uh, please uh, let us know you're here. We'd love to just send you uh, uh, some information about us and welcome you to the family. So use the, the, the number, the, uh, the WhatsApp number uh, on your screen and we'd just love to send you a shout. Just tell us you're happy to, you're here and we'd just love to just send you a shout and include you in our, in our WhatsApp community. So you'll always know what's going on at Mavuno. Now, each uh, week this month, I want to just be answering questions that different ones of you are asking. So if you have questions about this sermon or questions about last week's sermon, uh, please send them to us uh, and uh, use uh, info at uh, mavunochurch.org. And uh, we would love to just answer them. So, to, so last week I, I preached about debt and I had so many different questions. Uh, one of them was, Pastor M, is there such a good thing as, is there such a thing as good debt and bad debt? And I always get asked that question. Uh, and so let me just say this. I, uh, I don't want to, I, like I said before, the Bible doesn't call debt a sin. But I really do believe in this time, in this season, that God wants us to be a debt-free house. He wants us to be a debt-free people. And so I think that's a question that many people will ask out there. But here's a thought. I really sense God's instruction for us is that that will not even be an option for us in business and in our household. Uh, yes, I do believe that it's possible to take a debt uh, that you're able to extinguish in a quick time uh, so that the interest is not debilitating and that you also have an asset that you could easily lose uh, so that if uh, something goes wrong, you're not presuming on the future. If something goes wrong, you can quickly uh, sell that asset and pay off that debt. So I think there are ways to mitigate so that the risk is lower. But what we're saying is in this season, I really sense God is saying that is not the path for his children at Mavuno Church. Uh, another question that came up uh, from several life groups is, hey, what's the update on Mavuno's debt? Uh, because we do have a debt as a church. And I think one of the things I'll say about that debt is, um, yes, we do have a mortgage uh, of almost 100 million shillings right now that we are paying off. And uh, one of the things about that debt is, again, it's one of those presumption things, I think, when I think back uh, as a leader, uh, because what happened is we incurred a debt on the basis of pledges that were given uh, by the people of Mavuno Church uh, when we were buying our Hill City campus. And of course, the pledges were way more than actually what the campus cost us. Uh, in the middle of the move, some things happened that we were not expecting to happen and several people uh, were not able to fulfill their pledges and many actually did not fulfill their pledges. And so we were left with this debt. We have been paying it off consistently uh, and uh, we've never been in trouble with a bank. We're able to pay it off every month. But one of the desires of my heart and I really do believe that this is something God is saying to us as a church, is that as we're extinguishing our own personal debts, that Mavuno will also be out of debt by this time next year. I know it will take a miracle of God, uh, but I, I believe with all my heart that God will show us how to do this. And I want you to just join your faith with me and trust God uh, that this will actually be the case as well. And even as I invite you to that conversation, I know there are some of you who are visitors, some of you are part of this house. Uh, I want to just share that so we can be open because we believe uh, just in, in, in the uh, principle of accountability and openness when it comes to how we manage resources in this house. Uh, as we give today, the verse that God really put in my heart uh, and as we worship Him in our giving is Luke chapter 16, verse 10. And it, and it says, and this is, a, this is a prompting that the Holy Spirit gave me, 
Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. I believe that God is calling us not to be faithful when we have much, but he's calling us to be faithful with the little that he's entrusted to us. And faithful in his work, faithful in our giving, faithful in our supporting of his work, and faithful also in the principles we're learning this month uh, about getting out of debt and about doing the things that God is challenging us to do. And I believe that as we do this, I really believe that a season of unprecedented prosperity is coming to every single one of us. I don't know, I just have such a strong sense of belief that our, our next year, by end of next year, that every single one of us who's part of this family uh, will be in a very different place financially than we are right now. And so as we give, let, allow me to just pray for us as we give and as we prepare for God's word. Father, I thank you for your children. I thank you that, Lord, uh, in this place, uh, in this house, there is blessing and there is fullness of joy. And because you're here at your right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. I thank you because, Lord, you have given good gifts to your children. And as we come in thanksgiving to, to worship you, as we come towards to give towards your work, I pray that, Lord, uh, you would bless the, the work of our hands and that you would bless everything that we do that it will succeed. And that, Lord, even as you continue to bless us, Lord, help us to be faithful with whatever you bring our way uh, because we know that, Lord, we are preparing for you to entrust us with much more. And so I bless you, God's people. And I pray right now, even as we listen to God's word, expand our hearts. And Lord, open our hearts towards hearing your word. And I pray that, Lord, every single one of us will be quick to listen, quick to understand, and quick to obey. We love you, Lord, and we bless you. For we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Greetings, Mavuno family. Welcome to church. My name is Pastor M. Omoredi Wanjao, Senior Pastor of Mavuno Church. And wherever you're watching from, whether you're watching from your car, you're watching from your house, you're watching, uh, maybe you're working somewhere, uh, we're so glad you can be with us today as we worship God, as we listen to His Word. Uh, for our visitors, we're so glad if this is your first time with us, we're so, so happy that you're with us. We're going through a series this month, and it's called Vaccinate Your Money. We're talking about how to break the curses that affect our money because uh, the things that affect our money are spiritual in nature. The diseases of our money are spiritual in nature. So how do, we, how do we vaccinate them? How do we break the curses that have held us, have held our families back, and some of us for generations? We've looked at two different curses so far. We've looked at the curse of indebtedness, and we've learned that money, that, that debt is not a money issue, it's a contentment issue. And we've talked about how to break the curse of debt in your family. And then last week, we talked about the curse of consumerism. We learned that, you know, this, the vaccine for this curse is simplicity. And we even defined that. We talked about how to begin to declutter, how to begin to simplify, how to begin to save. So that we are free. We free ourselves from this curse that has afflicted so many people in our generation. You know, God, I believe, is raising up a generation that is debt-free, that is prosperous, that is able to walk through this continent and solve the problems it faces. And I believe that you are one of the people that God is going to use in our generation. Somebody say amen. Awesome, awesome, awesome. And you know, today I have a live audience. I'm so excited to have uh, some people in the house as well, even as we preach online. And so I'm looking forward to just interacting. If you're in the house and you want to say amen, please do that, uh, because we want to just dive into God's Word. Today we're going to be talking about the third curse. And it's a third curse that has limited many people, both in Africa and across the world. It is the curse of stagnation. The curse of stagnation. And what is stagnation? A definition of stagnation is a situation in which something stays the same. Something does not grow or develop. This is what stagnation is. When you have stagnation, you are stuck. You never seem to be moving forward. You're, always, you're, you're never growing. You're never developing. And that's a definition of stagnation. A second definition of stagnation has to do with liquids uh, or gases. It says a situation in which a liquid or air does not move or does not flow. So, so what does that mean? It means that when you, when you say a pool is stagnant, you're saying it's not moving, it's not flowing, it's locked up. And usually stagnant water, you know this, it smells unpleasant and it's probably not good for your health. When a person has stagnation, they're locked up. They're not healthy. 
They're not moving. They're working harder and harder and somehow they just never seem to move forward. They might even have a good job. They have good education. They have great potential. And everybody says, my goodness, look at the potential this person has. But that's where it ends. It ends with potential. And you know something? They have so much. And everybody says they could do so much, but they just never seem to achieve much. Do you know, do, do you know anybody like that? Have you ever encountered people who are in that space where they have potential, but they just never seem to move forward? We're going to be talking about that today. And I believe that God wants to free a family today. God wants to free a person today from the curse of stagnation. Somebody say amen. amen. Yeah, stagnation is not your portion in Christ Jesus. This is not what God has for you or for your family. So I want you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 25. We're going to be reading from verse 14 to 30. And we want to see what God has to say. Uh, Jesus was teaching his followers. And uh, he was showing how the kingdom of, of heaven works. And what does that mean? He was showing what it looks like when God is in charge. And he gives several stories. And the first story, which I'm not going to read, is a story of the ten virgins. The ten, actually, I, I call it the, the ten bridesmaids. I think that's a word we'd use today. The ten bridesmaids. And you know the story? There are five of them who carried oil, extra oil. There are five of them who didn't carry enough oil. And basically what happens, the wedding party was delayed. The groom was meant to come in the daylight or just in the evening. He ended up coming much later with his bride. And these five ladies, when they woke up, everybody was asleep. They asked their friends for oil to keep their, their lamps uh, uh, on because they had to have lamps on. Their friends didn't have enough for them, so they went to look for oil and they ended up missing the whole feast. Now, I've always thought that this passage really talks about how we should be spiritually alert, that we should be waiting for Jesus to return. We should keep fasting. We should keep praying. We shouldn't fall asleep. We shouldn't uh, lose focus. But you know, when I read this passage, I notice something very interesting. The difference between the foolish uh, bridesmaids and the wise ones is not that the foolish ones didn't pray enough because there's nothing here about prayer. <laughs> it's not that the, the foolish ones fell asleep because all of them fell asleep. The only difference is that the foolish ones did not have enough spare oil. They didn't have reserves for when the bridegroom came. And so they had sincere hearts. They were, they were just like everybody else. They loved the bridegroom just like everybody else. But guess what? When the bridegroom came, they did not have the reserves. They had good intentions, but they lacked the means to carry out their intentions. You know, I believe there are many Christians today who love God. They love him with all their hearts and they sincerely want to serve him. They want God to use them to carry out his purposes in the world. They want to be fearless influencers, but they lack the means to carry out their intentions. What do I mean by this? They want to bless the poor. They want to go on missions. They want to advance the gospel. But they are too busy hustling, working early, morning, late at night, because they don't have extra time or reserves to allow them to serve in ministry. Extra reserves to serve the poor in any significant way. <laughs> what if every one of us, imagine if every one of us had everything we needed to serve God as much as we needed to. Imagine if you didn't have to worry about day to day and, the res and, and, and do I have enough to feed my family, that you had enough reserves that you could bless the people around you. You see, like this, uh, f uh, this, this, these foolish bridesmaids, many of us, we have good intentions, but we lack the means to carry out our intentions. But like I said, that's not what the sermon is today. The sermon is actually about the next story, which is about the kingdom of heaven as well. And I'm going to read it because it's called the parable of the talents. Matthew chapter 25 and it starts from verse 14. So read with me. It says, again, there will be a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. To one, he gave five talents of money. To another, he gave two talents. And to another, one talent. Each according to his ability. Then he went on a journey. The man who had received five talents went at once and put his money to work and gained five more. So also the one with two talents gained two more. But the man who had received the one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of the servants returned and he settled accounts with them. The man who had received five talents brought other, the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five talents. See, I've gained five more. And the master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. 
You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two talents also came, Master, you entrusted me with two talents. See, I've gained two more. And the master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one talent came. Master, he said, I knew you're a hard man, harvesting where you've not sown and gathering where you've not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your talent in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. And his master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have taken it, I would have received it back with interest. Take the talent from him and give it to the one who has 10 talents. For everyone who has will be given more and he, who, and he will have an abundance. And whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him and throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there is, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, this is a very interesting passage, you know, and I think we can glean a few, pass, a, a few uh, uh, points from it that I think will be helpful for us as we talk about this curse of stagnation. The first thing, and this one is very simple. Number one, everything we have comes from God. Everything we have comes from God. Now, here's a master, and the master obviously in this passage represents God himself, and he entrusts different amounts of money to his servants, each according to their ability. Now, here's the most important principle when it comes to kingdom resources, when it comes to your money as a Christian. You need to understand this, that when it comes to money, all your wealth belongs to God. Everything you have belongs to God. By the way, that lesson will completely change the way you manage money. Once that, uh, that sinks into your head, even your ease with money will completely change. That's the one thing that makes a huge difference. As Moses taught in Deuteronomy, verse eight, chapter 8, verse 18, he says, remember, remember that verse, he says, but remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms his covenant, which is what your ancestors, as it is today. You see, wealth creation, it's a spiritual responsibility. And it's tied to your mandate as believers because God says he gives you the ability to create wealth to confirm his covenant. There's something very spiritual about why God entrusts you with resources. Everything we have comes from God. Point number two that we learn from this passage, God expects us to be financially fruitful. So when he, this master is entrusting his resource to his servants, he's expecting one thing from them. It is fruitfulness. Now, I've expect, I, I, when I used to read this passage, I used to think that maybe this passage means that I should use my gifts and my talents to serve God. And you know, no doubt, that's not a bad thing. It's true. But it's not what this passage is teaching. You know, the interesting thing is, this passage is very focused on money. It's actually about money. I think the reason we get confused is because of the word talent. <laughs> because in our language, talent means, or in, in English, talent means uh, your gift, your ability whatever it is that you're gifted with. But in the original language, and if you read the NIV here, it accurately translates it, it talks about bags of gold. Talents was actually a monetary term. And a talent was a lot of money. It was a large amount of money when you hear 10, ten talents. A talent was something like to, in today's money, uh, there are different, uh, when you look online, you're gonna find that there are different uh, uh, approximates of what it meant, but every single one of them would tell you it was over a million US dollars. So we're talking about 100 million Kenya shillings or 3 billion Uganda shillings for those of you who are watching from Uganda. It's a whole ton of money. So even the one who was given one was given over a million US dollars. Now, the first thing you'd expect in this passage, you'd expect the master to be happy with the servant who multiplied five talents and even more to be really excited about him more than even the one who multiplied just two talents. But you see, the dif you see a difference. When you read this passage, that's not what you're going to hear. The master says exactly the same thing to both of them. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. Come, <laughs> enter into your master's happiness. I mean, pass I mean, this is powerful. The exact same thing. You see, what gave their master joy was not the amount of talents, but the fruitfulness of each servant. That's what gives God joy 
is your fruitfulness. When you multiply the resources he's put in your hands. Now, the scenario was very different with the servant, the last servant. Because if I was me, I'd expect God, to, uh, the master to at least say, you know what? At least you didn't spend my money badly. At least you didn't buy yourself many pairs of shoes with my money. At least you didn't take it and use it for your own hustle. <laughs> at least you've kept it and returned it the way I gave it to you. That's what I'd expect the master to say. But that's not what he says. He says, seriously, you wicked, lazy servant. At least you should have taken my money and put it on deposit with the bankers. So when I returned, I would have gotten some interest from it. Surely, even if you're how fearful, even if you're how lazy, you could have at least put it in a fixed deposit account <laughs> and let the money multiply. Do something to bring fruitfulness. Don't hide it under your mattress. That's what the master said to the servant here. You see, here's the, the point I want you to remember when it comes to money and when it comes to this curse of stagnation. That a good and faithful servant is one who multiplies God's resources. A, it's so simple, isn't it? A good and faithful servant is one who multiplies God's resources. Many of us, we're praying for God to bless us with resources. Anybody praying for God to bless them with resources? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're praying for God to bless us with resources. God bless me. Give me promotion. Give me extra income. Give me streams of income. Lord, I want to have resources. But what happens when the resources come? We consume them. Instead of multiplying them, we consume everything. And the crazy thing is that God defines this. What's God's definition of our lifestyle? Wickedness and laziness. Oy. Okay, now I've been told by some people that this series is really harsh. So I'm trying to be as compassionate as I can. And just to say only what I see God's word saying. But didn't God say it himself? Like this is not Pastor M saying it. Like God says, you wicked, lazy servant. That's what he says. When I give you resources, and as opposed to multiplying them, you consume them, then you're not just a not, not savvy investor. <laughs> you're actually a wicked, lazy servant. That's what God, God, God is saying. Why would God want us to multiply resources? Why is it that God is so keen that when he gives us resources, we're multiplying those resources? I'll give you at least three reasons. Number one, to provide for your household. Like God actually expects you to be the one who provides for your household. We're praying for our households to multiply, to be blessed. First Timothy chapter 5 verse 8 says, Anyone who does not provide for their relatives, especially for their own household, has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So if your household is struggling, if your household is going through problems and stress, and you are not providing for them, the Bible says, my goodness, you're worse than an unbeliever. And so the first thing is God is saying, I will provide resources for you to multiply for the sake of your household. Your household is your children, it is your extended family, it is the people around you. You are God's plan A for their provision. I mean, that's what God is saying. But number two, the other reason God gives you, it's not just to provide for your household, it's to subdue the earth. Our key mandate is subduing the earth. Genesis chapter 1 verse 28, God bless them. This is Adam and Eve, our ancestors. And he said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. <laughs> You see, he's saying it's our job to have dominion over the earth. You see, what does that mean? It means maybe there's a billboard outside your office and it's got profanity on it. You hate that message on it. Here's the answer. Don't bile about it. Own the billboard. Buy it out. Put your message on that billboard. Jesus saves. <laughs> do, do something useful with that billboard. That's how you subdue the earth. You know, maybe some of you are so concerned about teenage pregnancies. Uh, around you uh, or you're seeing drunk young men in your village up country and you're so concerned about it the Bible it's not don't be concerned start an institution start a halfway house start an organization do something bring resources about to train those young men so that they stop being drunk that's how we subdue the earth so God is saying I will give you my resources multiply them so that the world will be changed and then number three so number one household number two subdue the earth number three to fund the work of the gospel to fund the work of the gospel. The Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 to 20, that we need to go into all the world, make disciples of all the nations, and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything that Jesus commanded us. That was his last command to us, his followers. We cannot claim to be his followers if we're not doing the last thing he asked us to do before he left. Good intentions are not enough. 
Like those bridesmaids, we can't just say, I want to be a good follower. I want to be a good Christian. Listen, if you don't have the resources, the reserves, the means to carry out your commission, then you're just like one of those foolish bridesmaids. A good and faithful servant is one who multiplies God's kingdom resources. There's a very powerful lesson to be learned here. And it's one that I wish when I was younger, somebody taught me. By the way, I didn't know this. For you, who, you, those of you who are listening to this in your 20s and younger, I'm so happy for you. Because this is stuff that somebody, many people would have wished somebody taught them when they were younger. And by the way, even those of you who are older, it's not too late to learn this stuff. God's, God's kingdom resources, God has a way of accelerating you when you lean into obeying his word. I used to know how to handle resources well because somebody taught me this. We had mentors when you we were younger. So we're taught from a young age to be good at saving. We're taught with my wife from a young age to, be, to, to avoid debt. So we never struggled with the curse of indebtedness and with the curse of, of, of consumerism. That was never our thing. But the thing that we were not taught how to do is how to invest money or how to multiply money. And I know many, many people, many who are watching this, this is true of you as well. And as a result, I missed and we missed many opportunities to grow our money by allowing it to multiply so that we could use it even more for God's resources and uh, for God's purposes. And I know I'm not alone. In fact, one of my friends who is uh, an, a financial advisor, he was telling us something very startling. He says that in Kenya, and I'm speaking just in Kenya right now, I know this is a case in, many, in much of our continent. Uh, in Kenya, there are 10 million bank accounts with 2 trillion uh, Kenya shillings sitting in them. 2 trillion is a lot of money. That's 18 billion USD. Uh, that's a lot of money, and we're talking about current and savings accounts. In contrast, he talked about the fact that there are only 200,000 professionally managed investment accounts. So, 2 trillion shillings that is sitting in bank accounts, earning very little interest for us. It might as well be buried in the ground. <laughs> that is the recipe for stagnation. You know, some of us, our biggest joy in life is going to the ATM and punching the numbers and seeing the balance. Oh, hallelujah. There are some zeros in there. I can see some big numbers. And that's, that's, that just makes you feel so safe. But you need to understand, that is like the guy who just buried his money in the ground. The bank is not your friend. They're not there to make interest for you. They're actually there to make interest for themselves. You're, you're earning for them. You're making interest for them. And, and, and it's like, the master is like, why don't you at least put it into a fixed deposit? Increase the amount of interest so it beats inflation. You see, there's a difference between, the, between saving and investing. I used to think that they were the same thing at one point, but they're not. Saving is when you consume less than you earn, and you keep the surplus aside in a bank or as cash <laughs> under your mattress. Uh, you put it somewhere so that it actually is safe. And that's, we kind of talked about a bit of that last week. But investing is when you take the next step, and you take your savings and you buy assets. Assets that will increase the amount that your money is earning for you. That your money, you stop being the one to earn, but your money now starts earning for you. That's what an asset is. Assets include things like stocks and bonds and mutual funds and real estate. Things that will give you a return for the money that you put in. You multiply. Your money starts to multiply. That's what an asset is. And you can get that money today. It can get the multiplication today. That's called cash flow. Or you can get the multiplication in the future, and that is called capital gains. When you, you, you buy a piece of land and you know that with time, you, you get it back or you sell it at a higher return, that's called capital gains. So that's, how you, that's what it means to buy an asset. That's, that's investment. Now, why is it that many people don't invest? I'll tell you it's for two main reasons. One is ignorance, and two is fear. And it's interesting that this, serv this servant, he had, he had the both reasons. You're going to find that in the first one, ignorance, he says in Matthew 25, verse 24, he says, I knew you're a hard man, <laughs> in harvesting where you've not sown, gathering where you've not scattered seed. In other words, he was completely ignorant about the purpose of money. He thought that the master was, give, was taking advantage of him. He, he completely was ignorant about the purpose that God was giving him, that, that the master was giving him this money. He assumed that the master was taking advantage of him. Well, the truth was that the master was actually lovingly trusting him with resources to grow his management capacity. That's what God gives you money, by the way, for. He wants to grow your management capacity. You see, when you don't understand the purpose of your money and why God gives it to you, you will never be a kingdom investor. You'll be walking around in ignorance 
Not understanding, my goodness, I'm the one supposed to be taking dominion in this estate. I'm the one supposed to be taking dominion in this industry. You don't understand because you're ignorant. And you will think of money as unspiritual. You will think of money as not connected to your faith, as something completely different from what you're doing when you come to worship God. And you won't understand that money is there to help you fulfill your destiny. The reason that God created you for. You will remain financially illiterate. And you will, not, you will be too busy to take time to understand how money works. And even those of you who like reading books on money, you'll find that you don't have time to read books on how to invest as a kingdom investor. Because God doesn't just want us to be investors. He wants us to be kingdom investors. The sad thing is that, king, that ignorance is keeping many Christians in stagnation today. The second thing is fear. And again, it's so funny, this servant has fear as well. Verse 25, he says, So I was afraid. And I went out and hid your gold in the ground. <laughs> you know, fear is what keeps you from investing, so you hide your money in the bank. In the ground. And I call, put your money in a savings account. I put that, I, that's like putting your money in the ground. Fear is based on, sometimes can be based on, this fear can just be based on the fact that you don't trust God has your back. You fear that, you know what, I, I have to look after myself. I'm not sure God will look after me if things go wrong and I invest. Some fear, because, some, some fear to invest because they say, I don't have enough money to invest. Investing is not for me. It's for people who have a lot of money. And you don't understand, my goodness, no, no, no. Even with the little, God expects faithfulness. In fact, the Bible talks about being faithful in little so that you'll be trusted with much. And you don't understand that your lack of faithfulness with that little pocket money you have is what's keeping you from becoming blessed to actually manage a lot of resources. Fear is what keep, makes us happy to keep money under the mattress, to look at that bank account and feel good because we have money in the account. We bury God's treasure in the ground and we become wicked and lazy servants. And there are many people who are watching right now that fear has caused you or your family to stagnate. But here's the good news. By the way, this passage has a lot of good news. So please don't feel like uh, this is just uh, a bad news passage. Here's the good news of something I have for somebody here. It was never intended to be that way. God's intention for you is to be fruitful. You are intended to be fruitful. You are intended to multiply. You are intended to fill the earth and to subdue it. That is your portion. So somebody, come on, just lighten up right now. Smile a bit. God wants you to break this curse over yourself and the family. How many of you are ready to break that curse? Yes. Amen. I believe that God wants us that from today, today will be a completely different day, that we will break this curse and this will never be an, a bondage in our family again. Now, what will make the difference? Because I, I want to tell you this and I, I keep sensing this. There are some who will take this message and run with it and it will make a difference. And there are others who will listen to me and be in exactly the same position next year. What will make the difference? Here's two things, two steps. Please note these steps if you're taking notes. Because these are the ones that will make a difference for you. Step number one, invest in your financial literacy. Invest in your financial literacy. You see, the best way to deal with ignorance is to be aware of how things work. One of the reasons that that guy uh, put that money in his mattress is because probably he was ignorant. He did not understand what kingdom money was about. And I mentioned before in this series that I've written two books, Financial Fitness and Financial Foundations. That's a great place for you to start. Start by reading books uh, on kingdom resources. Commit to read at least one book a month on money for the next uh, couple of years. And by the way, you'll be shocked at what a head start that will give you. Uh, there's some good local courses as well that you can do. There are courses on money for those of you who prefer to be in a classroom setting. And there's a great book called Straightforward Financial Growth. Uh, there's a course that is run by Apostle Moses Mukisa of Worship Harvest, a good friend of ours. I recommend that. It's a great course. Uh, there's one written by Pastor Caro and I. It's called Couples and Money. Uh, it's fo focused on couples. And that's a fantastic course as well. Commit yourself to grow. Make a resolution and say within the next few months, we're going to sign up for a course. We're going to read several books and grow that hunger to keep learning. So number one, invest in literacy. Because as you invest in knowledge, knowledge drives out ignorance. But number two, start with what you have. Start with what you have. Some people just get paralyzed and you just feel like can't start. Start where you are with what you have. You know, investments come with risk. In fact, they say the greater the risk, the higher the return. But risk often leads people to fear. And this man had a lot of fear in him, this servant. And the only way to avoid fear is to confront it. <laughs> you know, investment advisors talk about uh, making sure you have three buckets. And this is how they just simplify it. I learned this and it was so revolutionary for me. That you can actually have three, three buckets for investments. The first one is a short-term bucket. This is the first place you start putting aside money. And the first thing is you, have to, you should put at least three to six months expenses aside. 
to help you for a calamity in, in a, for a rainy day in the future. So how do you, do you have three to six months uh, pushed aside somewhere that you can always reach to when a crisis comes up? By the way, that will help you. It will help so many of us when challenges come. Because challenges come even to believers. And so this is the first thing you do. Saved funds that are kept in a low risk space, uh, fixed deposits or money market. And you can, somewhere where you can withdraw them within a maximum of three days. Uh, should you need them. We call these liquid assets. The second bucket is your medium term bucket. So there's a short term bucket, but there's a medium term bucket. This is where you put money that you're saving within the next three to five months so that you can buy your assets. There are things you need to purchase. And many times we get loans because we don't save. I can tell you that I've owned several cars in my life. I've never bought a car on a loan because I always save in advance for it. And rather than giving them the bank my interest, within three to five years, I've saved for myself and I've been able to purchase the car that I needed. And this is where you start to put those kinds of savings. Maybe some of you want to go to school and pay for a degree in the next few years. This is when you start to put your midterm savings and they can earn a little more interest than your short term ones. And then finally is your long term bucket. And your long term bucket is where you put money that you wouldn't need over the next five years. You will need it for at least five years. Uh, this is your retirement savings. This is your college fund for your kids. This is the stuff that is in the long term. And this one is the one you can take, you can put high risk investments. Uh, this is where you can buy that plot of land that you hope will appreciate one day. This is where you buy stocks at cheap prices that you know will appreciate. It's for things and for money you don't use, you're not going to use in the long term, uh, in, in, at least in the short term. So I'm just, I'm just giving you these as principles. And as you read the books, you're actually going to find a lot more detail on this. But the thing I want you to remember today as we're concluding is that a good and faithful servant is one who multiplies God's resources. Will you be a good and faithful servant? And this is a time that I want you to just begin to apply this message. This is a time I want you to start to lean forward. God wants you not just to be a hearer of his word, but a doer of it. And that's why every, uh, every week this month, we've given you a challenge. And the first week, if you remember, challenge number one, that all of us will be out of debt by this time next year. Some of you, by the way, already, God is applying, giving you wisdom. And by the end of this year, you're not going to wait till September next year. You're already seeing how you're going to get out of debt. Number two is that at least all of us will be saving 20% of our income at the very least by the end of, uh, by this time next year. And some of you, by the way, you don't have to wait for that time. You can even start right now uh, as God enables you. And then the last, the third challenge I want to give this is my third challenge, my challenge for today. Are you ready for the challenge? Yes. <laughs> so here's what I want you to do. That all of us will commit to have at least one month's expenses saved by the end of this year. At least one month and at least three months by this time next year. By this time next year, everybody in Mavuno Church will have an emergency fund. Yes. And some of you, by the way, it will even be six months that you'll have put aside for a rainy day. And I guarantee you God's people, that if you will take this challenge, if you will do this thing obediently, not even thinking about it, that you just commit yourself to do it, my goodness, you will be part of a wealthy church. You will be part of a wealthy community. You will be one of those that people, of people that God is using and you're able to step out, not just with good intentions, but with the ability to carry out those intentions. You will be one of those wise bridesmaids. Now I see you, God's people, I see you. I see you breaking the curse of stagnation. I don't hear amens right now. Amen. I see you not having to hustle for money. I see you not working because you have to, but because you love your job. I see you living an inheritance for your children's children. Yes. How many of you are willing to take that step of faith yes. and break the step of stagnation? Amen. Amen. I want us to end with a prayer. And this is a freedom prayer. And I'm going to invite the worship team to say with me, wherever you are living in your living room, in your car right now, if you're able to see the screen, I want you to say this prayer with us. Are you ready? Let's pray these words together. Dear Heavenly Father, I confess that I've not been, been a good steward of your resources and that I've been influenced by a spirit of stagnation. I have allowed fear and ignorance to keep me from being a kingdom investor. But today, I declare that you are the source of all truth and that ignorance is not my portion. I declare that fear will not lead me to stagnation. I take captive every ignorant and fearful thought and I make them obedient to Christ Jesus. I choose to be a faithful steward of the resources that you have entrusted to me for the sake of my family, your church, and your purpose for my life. May I be known for fruitfulness and may that be true of all my family members. 
I pray this in Jesus' name. And God's people say, Amen. Amen.